Section 74 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 48. Louis XIV, Literature and Art, Part 9. The academicians who were men of letters worked at the dictionary. The academicians who were men of fashion had become pretty numerous. Arnaud d'Andilly and M. de Lamoignon, whom the body had honoured by election, declined to join, and the Academy resolved to never elect anybody without a previously expressed desire and request. At the time when M. de Lamoignon declined, the kin, fearing that it might bring the Academy into some disfavour, procured the appointment in his stead of the coadjutor of Strasbourg, Armand de Rouen Soubise, quote, Splendid as your triumph may be, wrote Boileau to M. de Lamoignon, I am persuaded, sir, from what I know of your noble and modest character, that you are very sorry to have caused this displeasure to a body which is after all very illustrious, and that you will attempt to make it manifest to all the earth. I am quite willing to believe that you had good reasons for acting as you have done. The Academy from that moment regarded the title it conferred as irrevocable. It did not fill up the place of the Abbé de Saint-Pierre when it found itself obliged to exclude him from its sittings by order of Louis XV. It did not fill up the place of Monseigneur Dupanloup when he thought proper to send in his resignation. In spite of court intrigues, it from that moment maintained its independence and its dignity. Quote, M. Despreaux, writes the banker Le Verrier to the Duke of Noailles, represented to the Academy with a great deal of heat that all was rack and ruin, since it was nothing more but a cabal of women that put academicians in the place of those who died. Then he read out loud some verses by M. de saint Hilaire. Thus M. Despreaux, before the eyes of everybody, gave M. de saint Hilaire a black ball, and nominated all by himself M. de Mimur. Here, Monseigneur, is proof that there are Romans still in the world, and for the future I will trouble you to call M. Despreaux no longer your dear poet, but your dear Cato. With his extreme deafness, Boileau had great difficulty in fulfilling his academic duties. He was a member of the Academy of Medals and Inscriptions, founded by Colbert in 1662, quote, in order to render the acts of the king immortal by deciding the legends of the medals struck in his honour. Pontchartrain raised to forty the number of the members of the Petite Académie, extended its functions, and entrusted it thenceforth with the charge of publishing curious documents relating to the history of France. Quote, we had read to us to-day a very learned work, but rather tiresome, says Boileau to M. Pontchartrain, and we were bored right eruditely. But afterwards there was an examination of another which was much more agreeable, and the reading of which attracted considerable attention. As the reader was put quite close to me, I was in a position to hear and to speak of it. All I ask you to complete the measure of your kindnesses is to be kind enough to let everybody know that, if I am of so little use at the Academy of Medals, it is equally true that I do not, and do not wish to obtain any pecuniary advantage from it. End quote. The Academy of Sciences had already for many years had sittings in one of the rooms of the King's Library. Like the French Academy, it had owed its origin to private meetings at which Descartes, Gassendi, and young Pascal were accustomed to be present. Quote, there are in the world scholars of two sorts, said a note sent to Colbert about the formation of the new Academy. One give themselves up to science because it is a pleasure to them. They are content, as the fruit of their labours, with the knowledge they acquire, and if they are known, it is only amongst those with whom they converse unambitiously and for mutual instruction. These are bona fide scholars, whom it is impossible to do without in a design so great as that of the Académie Royale. There are others who cultivate science only as a field which is to give them sustenance, and as they see by experience that great rewards fall only to those who make the most noise in the world, they apply themselves especially not to making new discoveries, for hitherto that has not been recompensed, but to whatever may bring them into notice. These are scholars of the fashionable world, and such as one knows best. Colbert had the true scholar's taste. He had brought Cassini from Italy to take the direction of the new observatory. He had ordered surveys for a general map of France. He had founded the Journal des Savants, Literary men, whether Frenchmen or foreigners, enjoyed the king's bounties. Colbert had even conceived the plan of a universal academy, a veritable forerunner of the institute. The arts were not forgotten in this grand project. The academy of painting and sculpture dated from the regency of Anne of Austria. The pretensions of the masters of arts, or maîtres des arts, who placed an interdict upon artists not belonging to their corporation, had driven Charles Lebrun, himself the son of a master, to agitate for its foundation. Colbert added to it the Academy of Music and the Academy of Architecture, and created the French School of Painting at Rome. 
Beside the palace, for a long time past dedicated to this establishment, lived for more than thirty-five years Le Poussin, the first and the greatest of all the painters of that French school which was beginning to spring up, whilst the Italian school, though blooming still in talent and strength, was forgetting more and more every day the nobleness, the purity, and the severity of taste which had carried to the highest pitch the art of the fifteenth century the tradition of the masters in vogue in italy of the caracci of guido of paul veronese had reached paris with simon vouet who had long lived at rome he was succeeded there by a frenchman quote, whom from his grave and thoughtful air you would have taken for a father of sorbonne says m vitet in his charming vie de la sueur quote, his black eye beneath his thick eyebrow nevertheless flashed forth a glance full of poesy and youth his manner of living was not less surprising than his personal appearance he might be seen walking in the streets of rome tablets in hand hitting off by a stroke or two of his pencil at one time the antique fragments he came upon at another the gestures the attitudes the faces of the persons who presented themselves in his path sometimes in the morning he would sit on the terrace of trinity del monte beside another frenchman five or six years younger but already known for rendering landscapes with such fidelity such fresh and marvellous beauty that all the italian masters gave place to him and that after two centuries he has not yet met his rival end quote. Quote, of these two artists the older evidently exercised over the other the superiority which genius has over talent the smallest hints of le poussin were received by claude lorrain with deference and respect and yet to judge from the prices at which they severally sold their pictures the landscape painter had for the time an indisputable superiority claude gelet called lorrain had fled when quite young from the shop of the confectioner with whom his parents had placed him he had found means of getting to rome there he worked there he lived and there he died returning but once to france in the height of his renown for just a few months without even enriching his own land with any great number of his works nearly all of them remained on foreign soil le poussin born at andelys in fifteen ninety three made his way with great difficulty to italy he was by that time thirty years old and had no more desire than claude to return to france where painting was with difficulty beginning to obtain a standing his reputation however had penetrated thither king louis the thirteenth was growing weary of simon vouet's factitious lustre he wanted le poussin to go to paris the painter for a long while held out the king insisted quote, i shall go said le poussin like one sentence to be sawn in halves and severed in twain end quote. he passed eighteen months in france welcomed enthusiastically lodged at the tuileries magnificently paid but exposed to the jealousies of simon vouet and his pupils worried thwarted frozen to death by the hoar-frosts of paris he took the road back to rome in november sixteen forty two on the pretext of going to fetch his wife and did not return any more he had left in france some of his masterpieces models of that new independent and conscientious art faithfully studied from nature in all its italian grandeur and from the treasures of the antique quote, how did you arrive at such perfection people would ask le poussin quote, by neglecting nothing the painter would say in the same way, Newton was soon to discover the great laws of the physical world, quote, by always thinking thereon, end quote. During Le Poussin's stay at Paris, he had taken as a pupil Eustache Le Sueur, who had been trained in the studio of Simon Vouet, but had been struck from the first with the incomparable genius and proud independence of the master sent to him by fate. Alone he had supported Le Poussin in his struggle against the envious. Alone he entered upon the road which revealed itself to him whilst he studied under Le Poussin. He was poor, he had great difficulty in managing to live. The delicacy, the purity, the suavity of his genius could shine forth in their entirety nowhere but in the convent of the Carthusians, whose cloister he was commissioned to decorate. There he painted the life of St. Bruno, breathing into this almost mystical work all the religious poetry of his soul and of his talent, ever delicate and chaste even in the allegorical figures of mythology with which he before long adorned the Hôtel Lambert. He had returned to his favorite pursuits, embellishing the churches of Paris with incomparable works, when overwhelmed by the loss of his wife, and exhausted by the painful efforts of his genius, he died at thirty-seven, in that convent of the Carthusians which he glorified with his talent, at the same time that he edified the monks with his religious zeal. Le Sueur succumbed in a struggle too rude and too rough for his pure and delicate nature. Le Brun had returned from that Italy which Le Sueur had never been able to reach. The old rivalry, fostered in the studio of Simon Vouet, was already being renewed between the two artists. The angelic art gave place to the worldly and the earthly. Le Sueur died. Le Brun found himself master of the position, assured by anticipation, and as it were by instinct, of sovereign dominion under the sway of the young king for whom he had been created. Old Philip of Champagne alone might have disputed with him the foremost rank. 
He had passionately admired Le Poussin, he had attached himself de la sueur. Quote, never, says M. Vitet, had he sacrificed to fashion, never had he fallen into the vagaries of the degenerate Italian style. End quote. This upright, simple, painstaking soul, this inflexible conscience, looking continually into the human face, had preserved in his admirable portraits the life and the expression of nature which he was incessantly trying to seize and reproduce. Lebrun was preferred to him as the first painter to the king by Louis the Fourteenth himself. Philip of Champagne was delighted thereat. He lived in retirement in fidelity to his friends of Port Royal, whose austere and vigorous lineaments he loved to trace, beginning with M. de saint Cyran and ending with his own daughter, Sister Suzanne, who was restored to health by the prayers of Mother Agnes Arnaud. Lebrun was as able a courtier as he was a good painter. The clever arrangement of his pictures, the richness and brilliancy of his talent, his faculty for applying art to industry, secured him with Louis the Fourteenth a sway which lasted as long as his life. He was first painter to the king. He was director of the Gobelin and of the Academy of Painting. Quote, he let nothing be done by the other artists but according to his own designs and suggestions. The worker in tapestry, the decorative painter, the statuary, the goldsmith, took their models from him. All came from him, all flowed from his brain, all bore his imprint. The painter followed the king's ideas, being entirely after his own heart. For fourteen years he worked for Louis the Fourteenth, representing his life and his conquests at Versailles, painting for the Louvre the victories of Alexander, which were engraved almost immediately by Audrin and Edelink. He was jealous of the royal favor, sensitive and haughty towards artists, honestly concerned for the king's glory and for the tasks confided to himself. The growing reputation of Mignard, whom Louvois had brought back from Rome, troubled and disquieted Lebrun. In vain did the king encourage him. Lebrun, already ill, said in the presence of Louis the Fourteenth that fine pictures seemed to become finer after the painter's death. Quote, Do not you be in a hurry to die, Monsieur Lebrun, said the king. We esteem your pictures now quite as highly as posterity can. End quote. The small gallery at Versailles had been entrusted to Mignard. Lebrun withdrew to Montmorency, where he died in 1690, jealous of Mignard at the end as he had been of Le Soir at the outset of his life. Mignard became first painter to the king. He painted the ceiling of Val de Grasse, which was celebrated by Molière, but it was as a painter of portraits that he excelled in France. Quote, M. Mignard does them best, said Le Poussin not long before, with lofty good nature, though his heads are all paint, without force or character. End quote. To Mignard succeeded Rigaud as portrait painter, worthy to preserve the features of Bossuet and Fenelon. The unity of organization, the brilliancy of style, the imposing majesty which the king's taste had everywhere stamped about him, upon art as well as upon literature, were by this time beginning to decay simultaneously with the old age of Louis Fourteenth, with the reverses of his arms, and the increasing gloominess of his court. The artists who had illustrated his reign were dying one after another, as well as the orators and the poets. The sculptor James Sarrazin had been gone some time. Puget and the Anguier were dead, as well as Mansart, Perrault, and Le Notre. Girardon had but a few months to live. Only Coisevaux was destined to survive the king, whose statue he had many a time moulded. The great age was disappearing slowly and sadly, throwing out to the last some noble gleams, like the aged king who had constantly served as its centre and guide, like olden France, which he had crowned with its last and its most splendid wreath. End of section 74. End of chapter 48. End of a popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 5, by François Guizot.